Hello, my name is Shannon Sullivan. I am your host this evening for the Inside Scoop Virginia. And the topic of today's show will be women in politics. We want to strip the lipstick off the pig or whatever's being uh, marked up with makeup nowadays and actually get back to the issues of the presidential, the statewide campaigns, everything that seems to be uh, dissolving a little bit into the shadows with all of the, the rhetoric nowadays. Um, we are, above all, you know, interested in the economy. It's uh, made the, uh, the front page of every newspaper, every TV show, every talking head um, episode on the Sunday morning shows. It's a very turbulent time and I think what gets underestimated in today's you know political world is the impact that the economy has on women, their families, and any of the dependents which they're giving care to. Um, I, we want to talk about how women, they're first and foremost, you know, being paid less than men. We want to talk about pay equity. We want to talk about the poverty rates that women are suffering from and disproportional numbers. We want to talk about when the economy turns down how the women are the first to be laid off. We want to talk about what that impact will have on families and the children. With me today I have Eula Tate who is a retired lobbyist for the United Auto Workers and a good friend and a um, Hillary delegate to the Democratic National Convention. And I also have Rachel Rifkind, who is the chair of the uh, Virginia Democratic Women's Caucus and also a Hillary delegate to the Democratic National Convention. And as full disclosure, I was an Obama de delegate to the Democratic National <laughs> Convention. Um, I've preached on a little bit about the economy. Um, I think this just cannot be stated strongly enough, the impact that it has on women and the family and all the, the people that are dependent upon the wages that we bring into the house. Um, Yuli, I know you have a unique situation. I don't know if you want to expand upon it. Well, yeah, um, when you look at women today, particularly if you look at uh, those of us who are in the baby boom generation, mm -hmm. um, there's a situation where women today are not only caregivers for young children or so. teenage children, they also have aged parents. And that's an yeah. issue that uh, working women uh, probably have dealt with for their entire life, but now with the baby boom generation, uh, there's more and more of a situation where women are far more responsible with less money and, mm -hmm. and, and more responsibility and, and has a, a, a tremendous impact on working women in this country. Very much so. I know all three of us actually have the unique opportunity. I'm a representative for the United Food and Commercial Workers Local 400. You worked for the, the UAW. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, you know, you worked for the Pension Fund, I believe, of uh, uh, Operating Engineers. Operating Engineers. Um, what is your uh, take then as far as maybe being a union woman, maybe being a single woman, uh, approaching this economy and the uncertainty that it it presents us with? Well, I, I worry every day about how I'm going to meet my immediate needs, how mm -hmm. I'm going to, I, I received notice from my condominium association that with the, with the, the energy crisis, <laughs> uh, our condo fees are going to jump 40% this yeah. year. That's, that's an exorbitant jump. Uh, it's, I don't know how much of that I can swallow. I'm fortunate uh, on the health care front that my mother is, is very healthy and, and I don't have to, to worry about her yet. Um, but it is, it is a concern. It is a concern. I, 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 I don't know where the gasoline, you know, where that's going to go. Oh, very much so. Uh, $5 a gallon, uh, $6 a gallon. How many of us can afford that <laughs> and be able to get to work? And just think about the home heating costs. And the home heating costs. Oh, and, and what and that's going to do with our elderly um, family members uh, who are unlimited on fixed incomes. That's right. And there are a lot of women, I believe the majority of women that are on fixed incomes and dependent upon Social Security, are living in that precarious position where it's your government paycheck yes. that is your bread and butter. Um, you bring up health care. I know that is a uh, very important issue for this campaign, and I think it's gotten glossed over with a lot of rhetoric. Um, <laughs> and our, <laughs> <you retirees>. laugh. <laughs> our retirees are, are, are seeing increases in their Medicare premiums yep. without an increase in their retirement. So any, any increase, well, they are getting an increase in their retirement income, but then it's been eaten up mm -hmm. by the increases in the medical premium. So there's, there's no there's no safety net in there. Do you end up getting a lot of calls to the, the office yes, about that? Yes, yes. Well, has anybody even taken a look at what's going on with prescription drugs in this country today, too? And what impact that it has have, um, particularly mm -hmm. on, on senior citizens and, and, the, yep. and those of us you know, as a retiree who are on, uh, on fixed income? Oh, I, I see that, that, that this, this campaign is about 
many, many, many issues. Mm -hmm. And I and I, I'm partisan in this campaign. Uh, I see there's, oh, only, there's only unleash. The, there's no <laughs> reason to be bashful. There, there is only <laughs> one way that we can go in this campaign, mm -hmm. and I have a hard time understanding why many people are voting against their own special their self interests. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just they 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 don't. They're they're looking at different issues that are not the issues that oh. really matter. I mean, we see that every day at the, the bargaining table when we're striking out a new union contract. You know, we have, you know, sustainable wages, but the biggest pot of money is the health care. You know, uh, they have a very, very small copay, but the vast majority of it is still paid for by the company. And each and every year, it, they come back to us, and, you know, pr primarily in the North Virginia area, it's, you know, retail grocery. Well, Walmart. Walmart doesn't pay. You know, what are we going to do with those benefits? We're at a competitive disadvantage. And I really take great offense that that is what, you know, these employers, and it's not just the retail grocery industry, it's every employer, Absolutely. is approaching, you know, entrepreneurship. You know, that it is a burden to provide basic medical assistance to your employees. I mean, let alone how people are able to, to come to work, to be productive, one, to have attendance that it's at a uh, you know, reasonable rate. You accomplish that being, by being able to provide health care. You, know, you eliminate the worry. You eliminate the, the struggling with your schedule. And uh, the productivity, as I yes. said before, you know, it increases. Um, I think there's a, a vast you know, um, difference between the two candidates, for talking presidential now, um, their health care policies. Absolutely. Oh, yes. I think uh, on the, for the most part, the McCain side, it's lacking. And I know Obama and uh, Hillary when in the primary was, uh, they're very aggressive. This is a issue that has to be attacked nationally. You know, prescription drugs, you know, the, the it's, you know, on and on about the cost that this system is, you know, trickling down to the people that have to, you know, pay the bill. I, I instinctively, I really enjoyed listening to, to Obama talk about uh, that he wants to see the American people have the same type of coverage that the members in Congress mm -hmm. have. And I think that is the only way that we can go. We have to have a single payer national health care yeah. system where everybody is covered and you know it won't be this un unfair, unjust type of situation, Absolutely. you know, the have versus the have nots. You and know, it's not the just the line. And the poor and poor. He's very sincere that, you know, this is a basic requirement of, you know, to be able to live a solid middle class existence. And, you know, I think he talks about it being affordable, it being portable, yes. you know, and so it's not tied to one employer. A lot of our youth nowadays, and I guess I fit into that category, you know, they jump between occupations. And so not have to be able to, you know, find your newest doctor and, you know, struggle with, you know, transitioning between your, your medical care that that is a very, very important uh, aspect of his plan. Mm -hmm. And then also, uh, not to mention the, the, the Social Security and the retirement um, uh, plans of both of these candidates, <laughs> um, privatization versus the, the Social Security, for what it, how it was meant to, to work with everybody paying into it. Uh, I, I thought that it would be a, a grand situation right okay. now for this current administration to try to promote uh, privatizing Social mm -hmm. Security to this current Congress under these current oh, circumstances. Oh, that would be <laughs> a wouldn't it? It really would. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the turbulence of the economy nowadays, you know, for those people that thought they were going to invest their hard earnings, you know, into the stock market, you know, and I always love the line, I mean, we're going to create hereditary wealth. We're going to pass it down to future generations. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm scraping by and putting a little penny here and there into my 401k. I'm very, very lucky to have a defined pension plan. Yes. Um, but people don't have those options. No. No, and pensions are... are, are becoming very few uh, mm -hmm. and they're being cut and their, be their yeah. benefits are being cut. It's, it's so the, the reliability that so many people are able to have by knowing they have social security coming to them as a basic cushion in old age. You know, We'll be back in a few moments uh, right after this public service announcement. in 1991 and I've been a member since. I had the honor of serving on the board twice, once as its president. My concern about the corporation begins with the realization that the basis for our existence, a franchise with the county, ends in less than five years. The political winds tell us that the federal government will, at the end of that time, 
declare that since the county now has more than one provider, a franchise is simply not necessary. As soon as that matter is settled in law, we see no reason for the cable company to continue funding us at any level. The state will not help. The county has not helped the concept of free speech since Audrey Moore was on the Board of Supervisors in 1988. I was told last week that a strat plan would be presented to our board just before the election. What nonsense. That's an admission that the strategic plan does not exist. It hasn't existed for some time. Four main questions must be answered. Who are we? What are we trying to do? How will we do it? And what resources are required? Together with Jim Southworth, one of the 21 architects that built the internet, we can not only survive as a corporation, but go on to build a nationwide public access network. The plans of how Jim and me are already working on this with the Alliance for Community Media are, can be found on our website. You'll also find a way to sign up for our newsletter as well. If you care about our community, if you care about keeping a, a voice alive in this county, and if you care about what kind of a country we leave to the next generation, then vote for Jim and Leo at the next Fairfax Public Access Board of Directors members meeting on September 28th. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm your host Shannon Sullivan and I have with me Eula Tate who is a retired lobbyist for the United Auto Workers and Rachel Rifkind who is the chair of the Virginia Democratic Caucus Women's Committee. Women's Caucus. Women's Caucus of the Virginia Democratic Party. Uh, we kind of left off on retirement security and the importance that a lot of women in their old age are relying upon uh, social security. And I think what may need to be emphasized, you know, is again, you know, the difference between the Obama and the McCain camps in their, uh, their positions this year. Obama has stated, you know, unequivocally, you know, he will not privatize Social Security. He will not cut the benefits and he will not raise the retirement age. I know that uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty as far as Social Security, um, but knowing for future generations that this is an, of utmost importance, it's not something that the Democratic Party is looking to cut or to eliminate, um, I think should come as a, a reassurance to a lot of people. The, uh, did you have something to say, Hila? No, no. Uh -uh. <laughs> the, um, he also has stated that uh, he wants to change the bankruptcy laws. A lot of, um, not just you know, elderly uh, women, but a lot of families in general, their main source of savings is in their home, you know, the equity that you've built up in your home. And right now, when you go to uh, file for bankruptcy in unfortunate circumstances, that gets stripped away. He's looking to change the bankruptcy provisions so that you are able to readjust your mortgage to be able to pay a smaller amount so it's not affecting the value of the home, but to be able to stay in the home, to keep the value of the home, but to be able to, to work off to pay the mortgage. And I think that should be, a, again, of a reassurance to a lot of people. Another thing on his, uh, his security, his social security and retirement security platform is seniors making under $50,000 will not pay federal income t or federal taxes. Um, that's, uh, I don't know if it's that's been brought up before. That's going to make a lot of folks yeah, happy. Yeah, but sure uh, is. I actually was just doing a little research this afternoon. It's the first time I'd heard that. I, don't, I think it needs to get a lot more airplay. Um, but again, seniors making under you know, $50,000 and not paying federal taxes under the Obama plan. Well, if you noticed <laughs> on, uh, on the McCain campaign, you know, you hear folks talking about, you know, he's going to raise your taxes, your taxes are going to increase, your taxes increase. But those of us who make under two hundred fifty thousand dollars does not have to worry about a tax increase. Uh, Mr. Obama has promised not to raise taxes for folks who make under, under two hundred fifty thousand. And, and that that goes to the tone of this campaign. I. I I cannot tell you how many times I have seen an ad for McCain, from McCain, who, who, with the, the lies. <laughs> and they, they and were they, just outright lies. And, and they sent, and they've been disproven by, there's an organization called Vote Fact, or Fact Checker? Fact Check. Fact Check.org. Check. Mm -hmm. Check and they, they, they sit up there and they, and they 
look at this, look at these these claims and disprove them, mm -hmm. but they still are out there. And I guess they, they operate on the assumption that if you say it so many times, it becomes fact. Oh. I, and it and, is the, and the petit, repetitive little cliff note there. And I don't know how you fight that. I don't know how you. I know. The, Under two hundred fifty thousand dollars, it will be a tax cut for ninety-five percent of middle-class working families in the United States. Mike in Centerville. Mike, are you there? All right, if Mike, we'll get back to Mike if he's uh, on hold. We'll get back to you in a moment. Um, I had one last note on the, the retirement issue, which I thought was interesting. Um, we talk about personal bankruptcy. Now, on the corporate end, they call it reorganization. They don't like it. I do believe that we have a phone call um, coming from the word bankruptcy, <laughs> the reorganization of the company, but essentially doing the same thing. Um, well, they'll strip away your pension. They'll strip away your benefits of the employees, but you get these people up in their little tower. They're going to parachute down, you know, on golden wings. Um, under the Obama plan, you know, if you're going to be taking drastic cuts, which if it comes to the point of slashing your own employees' pension plans, you're going to take the same cuts. Yes. No golden parachute, no little benefit perk plan when you're walking out the door to become a lobbyist on your friend on K Street. You know, there's not going to be any more of that hypocrisy. The, so, the, only in America that. is it, do mm -hmm. you have bad performance and get rewarded handsomely oh, no. for it? You can bankrupt your company, but yet you go out it's um, been industry after industry. The, I mean, the airline, that's just one example, but... Uh, you know. We don't even want to talk about en Enron. I, I was thinking that, and <laughs> I wasn't sure <laughs> if I wanted to dull in that entirely. By the way, who Mr. McCain was a major player in that as mm. well. Oh, yes, yes, the Keating Five, yes. <laughs> and that somehow needs to be addressed and addressed and hammered home. Do, pe do you think people know what the, the Keating Five are, and uh, should we... Try to educate people. I oh, absolutely. I think we should. I think <laughs> go right for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I am I'm not an expert on it, but I know that, mm -hmm. that that John McCain was involved in the Keating Five, and he he it was the beginning of the deregulation of the savings and loans and the banking, yep. and and his he his his um, uh, supporters were all in that <laughs> industry and they all benefited from the deregulation that we are mm -hmm. suffering from today. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And I do believe that they are. Um, behind the scenes as far as economic advisors with his uh, campaign for president right now. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yes, oh yes. All right, I believe that we lost Mike from Centerville, but we are taking callers, so if there's anyone that wants to talk to us about women's issues, family issues, the divisive campaign and the stark differences between the Obama camp and the McCain camp, the number is 571-749-1166. So feel free to join us and we would love to take your call. Um, Eula, we were talking earlier, and I believe you have some personal experience, not necessarily on the pay inequity side of that, but I believe you know uh, Lily Ledbetter. Yes. Uh, That's been a I big part the, of this campaign. I had the distinct pleasure of, of meeting Lily Ledbetter. Uh, for those of you who don't know who she mm -hmm. is, she was a lady who uh, filed a Supreme Court case and lost uh, the Supreme Court case based on unfair pay or pay equity. Uh, it's called the Ledbetter versus Goodyear. She worked for Goodyear for almost 25 yeah. to 30 years. And during that particular time, she was a supervisor. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, she said if she had been a member of a union, a union? she would not have been <laughs> underpaid. But what happened is um, she was grossly underpaid mm -hmm. uh, from her male colleagues. And she filed a lawsuit through the Supreme Court. Um, and with this, you know, uh, Republican, Cons yeah, very conservative, conservative. Uh, what I call judicial activist uh, activism. Uh, yeah. Basically, they uh, basically said that her case uh, didn't have merit and mm. she was denied equal pay. I think they said, sorry, honey, you just didn't find out you're being discriminated soon enough. You know, the merit of your case, we're not going to discuss that. You just didn't know soon enough. She had to file within 120 days of her first, the first <laughs> paycheck she ever received. Mm -hmm. or when she first realized that she was underpaid. Yeah. 120 days. Oh, so, that's for all of you, that's incredible. That's, that's, that's absolutely, absolutely yeah, 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 yeah. For all those women that are, are looking at your pay stub and looking at your coworker next to you and not sure exactly what you're making or what he's making, um, we're looking for a change in the Supreme Court because right now you got to find out sooner rather than later. Otherwise, you may just be up 
Creek. <laughs> we, um, we'd like to talk a little bit more about pay equity and Lily Ledbetter when we come back. Um, the Supreme Court decision and what Mr. McCain's position on that may surprise you. <laughs> so we'll be back in just a few moments. Um, stay with us. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm Jim Girardi. I'm the, uh, one of the directors here for the Inside Scoop. And I'm here to talk a little bit about our producer. Uh, and Jim Southworth is probably one of the best uh, people we've worked with or I've worked with here at the studio. And I want to just go beyond what happens um, here at the studio during the production and during the show. I've worked with Jim in a bunch of different areas, and what we're talking about here is leadership. Uh, Jim knows how to bring people together. He knows how to solve conflicts. He knows how to uh, resolve problems. And typically, when we're on uh, during the show, we're having fun. Uh, all the technical stuff is handled, all of the conflicts are handled, and if there's ever any issue between people, Jim knows how to get it done, how to get it resolved with the least amount of um, any anxiety or any um, problems between the people that are involved. So when we're talking about leadership and what the station needs in terms of being able to listen, in terms of being able to solve problems, and in terms of bringing people together, that's Jim Southworth. So that vote is important for the stability of the station and the progress of the station. Hi, I'm Marlene Barney. Yeah, and I'm Tony Barney. And Tony and I have been members of FPA since 1991. I've been a member and a producer. I've produced uh, several shows here, award-winning, telly award-winning shows, um, including, and also a hometown video show. And I'm endorsing Leo Torzo and Jim Southworth for members of the board of FPA. They've been board members in the past. They've done nothing but improve this station, acquired, help us acquire the building, develop stu Studio C, bring on uh, quality staff members, upgrade the equipment. They're just great and I'm in their corner. Please vote for them, for board members of FPA. And I'd like to also want you all to get out and support uh, Leo and Jim. Uh, I've been with the uh, FPA Channel 10 since 1991. I've known them both for a long time, and it, it's a no-brainer. If you want Channel 10 to continue to grow and expand and serve the community, you, you just got to get out and vote for Leo and Jim uh, come September 28th. I've been on the, uh, in Loudoun County now the past nine years serving as uh, chairman of the Loudoun County Cable Commission, and there's no better partner for Fairfax County than both Leo Torozo and Jim Southworth when it comes to helping us and on our, and our issues in uh, Loudoun County. So to continue the partnership, let's support these two guys. Let's make uh, Channel 10 even bigger and better than it ever was. Thank you. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm your host Shannon Sullivan and I have with me Eula Tate who is a retired lobbyist for the United Auto Workers and Rachel Rifkin who is the chair of the Virginia Democratic Women's Caucus. You know all three of us were in Denver, uh, Obama and Hillary delegates. Um, before the break we were talking about the Lily Ledbetter decision. It was Ledbetter versus Goodyear. Supreme Court came down and said sorry Mrs. Lily Ledbetter uh, you didn't find out that you were discriminated against quite quick enough and that you cannot change challenge your pay inequities in a, a court of law. Uh, Lily Ledbetter had to have filed within 120 days in order to have any sort of legal action. Um, McCain, however, thinks that the Supreme Court just got it right. Why would you want to intervene as far as someone being paid? I believe the average is 77 cents on the dollar. Um, so I wonder if Sarah Palin well, knows that. <laughs> I wonder if she's going to be underpaid. Uh, <laughs> if, she, if she becomes the vice president. Hey, cost cutting. <laughs> yeah. I think they want to, ch they're all about change, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you, you stop and you think about this whole unequal pay and, and the impact that it has, not only just on, on women in general, yeah. but also on the entire family. If uh -huh. you look at 77 cents for every dollar every that dollar. a woman is paid, that means that she's going to have less Social Security when she gets ready to retire. Yeah. That means that she, you know, her pension money that she's able to put into a full mm -hmm. ripple, uh, ripple if effect. You, right. If you can't, if you don't earn it, you can't save it. So that means yep. that, you know, 
I, I think I saw a statistic where it says that a working if working family they lose about a hundred thousand dollars a year based that. on on, on just on pay equity with a woman working mm -hmm. in you know two families working you know two yeah. family uh, people working in a family. A oh, hundred thousand. This is a that's a family. That's issue. abominable. Yeah. The uh, if you were to purely close the wage gap between men and women, it would end up of a pay increase for at least, and this is you know on a minimum level. Fifty, I think, five thousand seven hundred dollars a year for women. For women. Mm-hmm. And of course, as you said, adds now, if you to calculate that, you know, over a thirty-year period, mm -hmm. how much money that would be if a person worked for thirty years? Fifty-seven hundred dollars in yes. one year just to close the gap. Oh, and uh, for those people that might be out there that are wondering, you know, you know, well, why are we whining on about, you know, pay inequalities? There's so many different circumstances that could explain it. And I know Mr. McCain agrees with you. He explains it all by way of those women just don't have the same education. They just don't have the same training. And that, that is such skills. a blatant lie yes. because if, if, if you look at the statistics, women are far more educated. We have far more training, far more education than men in this country mm -hmm. today. And they're graduating. There are graduating. Far more women in college yes. today. At and higher graduates. rates. And high, that's true, absolutely. Absolutely. And they're in the sciences and they're in the math. Yeah, so it is a, within a discipline, within a specific, you know, classification, your next door neighbor in your cubicle, you know, one door down, that has a higher paycheck than you. That's how it's calculated. We also have to take a look at some of the socialization process as well. Mm -hmm. um, women tend to be put in what you call the, the peak collar ghettos yeah. or you're placed in jobs, you know, who are basically, uh, that have been traditionally, traditionally held by women. Uh, you know, teachers, uh, nurses, uh, nurses. Yeah. You know, the caregivers, Care the yeah. providers mm -hmm. in, 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 in this society. You know, quite frankly, I think teachers should be paid far more than, I, I than doctors. I think that, and unfortunately, that's a statement on how we value not just women, yes. but how we're distributing wealth in our economy, and it's it's not going to the people that are educating our. You know, are young. Education you know. is something to be feared. Yeah. An educated person is something to be feared. Strange, isn't that? Yes. I do believe we have Mary from Clifton that wants to uh, weigh in on this discussion. Uh, Mary, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, first I want to thank you for doing a show on women's issues with the campaign. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Uh, they just wanted to make a statement that recently one of our local utilities outsourced a call center, which was disproportionately women, 80, I believe about 80 percent, and also m minorities. I was wondering if you could cover the McCain and Obama views on NAFTA and CAFTA, the difference in what protection um, either one had for women in jobs that are being outsourced. Whoa. NAFTA and CAFTA. Ah, I think the auto workers <laughs> may have a position or two on Whoa, that one. Oh, well. Do you want to have that, Eula? <laughs> yeah, actually, um, if I understand your question correctly, uh, you want to know what kind of impact that NAFTA and CAFTA has had on women's, um, women and how jobs have been outsourced in this country? And the campaign's positions. And the campaign the job, positions. Yeah. Well, from what I understand, Mr. Mr. McCain voted for both NAFTA and CAFTA, uh, and he's basically what you call a, a, a quote-unquote free trader. Um, Mr. Obama um, thinks that it needs to have free trade, but he also thinks that it needs to be fair, fair trade. trade. And what we mean by fair trade is that there should be worker rights mm -hmm. involved in that process. Uh, that um, uh, there, should, there should be some environmental standards mm -hmm. involved in that process, and that you know jobs, uh, you know, there's equal, Absolutely. equal, you know, for whatever uh, tariffs uh, that you have on that are paid to one country should be paid mm -hmm. back to uh, our country as well. That's fair trade. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if we constantly have a race to the bottom, and I understand the micro and macroeconomic view of you know outsourcing, truly, I, I understand if you're splitting the the pennies, you know, okay, you might save a couple, but what type of ripple effect are you having in the world economy? We have always, as a nation, I've, I've been listening to some history of America, and we've always been looking for cheap labor. Mm -hmm. It's it's been part of our of our culture it's, since the very beginnings of this <laughs> country, and 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 it's. It's, it's always going to be a fight. And, you know, the sad thing about that is that 
with NAFTA and CAFTA and, and this whole, you know, free trade type of economics yeah. that, that the, you know, the Bush administration and the Republicans have been pushing, uh, it has had a trickly uh, impact on wages in this country in general. You know, mm -hmm. all wages have failed uh, in yep. this country because of that. Uh, people who used to make 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars an hour now, you know, uh, if they lose those jobs, those jobs have been outsourced to other countries. That means that those, you know, they're looking for jobs now, they're being paid eight dollars an hour, five dollars an hour. So uh, it has definitely had a, a real negative impact uh, on, on everybody in this country, not just women in this country, but everybody, particularly those of us who came out of the automobile industry, mm -hmm. those of us who came out of the, the, you know, the steel industry, the whole, you know, the, what they call the iron, the yes. rust belt industry. Yeah. Um, well, they were industries. And manufacturing in this country. We've had some real negative impact to come to, to happen. I mean, those industries are what built a solid middle class Absolutely. America. Absolutely. I mean, it, it wasn't just the wages, it was the benefits. There was health care, there was pension. And it was, you were never going to get rich off of it, but you knew you could provide for a family. You could have a roof over your head. You could have a very honorable living. And um, somehow, again, I go back to the morality of our employers, you know, you're going to have a productive workforce, you're going to have a happy workforce, you know, you might pay a little bit more than what you can get in China or Indonesia, but, you know, what, the benefits that you're reaping, you know, in the long run for the communal impact. But that's, but that's they think for the moment, they think for the short term and, yeah. and not for the future. I mean, I think that can be demonstrated, you know, coming back to, you know, some of uh, McCain's voting record. Got to keep harping on that. <laughs> um, you know, the minimum wage. You know, the people that we are paying, the minimum, the base of our society. Um, he had voted 19 times against increasing it. And we had to struggle to get what we got this, this, mm -hmm. past, this past increase. It was, was a minimum, bare minimum, mm -hmm. and it was a struggle to get that. Thank God for and this is Kennedy. over, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yes. You know, we have some champions out there that, uh, definitely are going to go down in the history books. I mean, but 19 times. I mean, you have to think at some point it's going to be, you know, I think it was like $3.40 was where it would have been stuck at. I could be a little off on that figure. But 19 times you voted against actually increasing the minimum wage. And that's a record to be proud of. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, it, it absolutely, it, it amazes me how you can get away with that. I mean, there's a standard that people have to be able to live for themselves. Again, the women, you know, primarily in these middle class, or in these uh, minimum wage jobs, providing for a family. And for John McCain to say that he's one of us. Um, oh, goodness, yeah. I, I love this, you know, I am a, a blue collar, I love the working class public. I'm a beer heiress. <laughs> I, a couple beauty queens too, but I won't go into that. <laughs> but I mean, the, the wage inequalities in you know, our country, it just, it, there's, there's something that has to be addressed, you know, as far as you know, providing security. And I think that's something that we can look forward to in an Obama-Biden administration. Um, Let's see. We, we've talked a little bit about the, the minimum By the wage. Way, I do think mm -hmm. that Mr. Obama, when he becomes president, that the Equal Pay Act, the Fair oh. Pay Act, will yep. be the first bill that he will sign into oh, law. Right. You know, that's something that Lily Ledbetter and I both said to All each right. other, is that uh, we'll see you at the White House. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit less of this uh, ownership society uh, yes. or you're on your own. You know, we're going to take care of, you know, and I, I love the term, we are our brother's keeper. That's right. You know, we will provide for those at the dawn and at the sunset of their lives. So there's, there's a lot to be... Uh, looked forward to in this uh, campaign cycle and the new presidency, you know, God, we need a lot of change. Both camps seem to be uh, saying that they will be the change agents, they will be the maverick that will produce it we'll in this, see. this government, but uh, we'll see who will actually triumph with the issues on their side. You know, no lipstick glossing it over. I know how it should be. <laughs> oh, I think, I think we have three very intelligent ladies that are going to tell the, the American public, the Fairfax public, how it needs to be. And uh, <laughs> I think we'll be back with you in uh, a few moments right after this uh, public service announcement. Mark Levine, host of the Inside Scoop and a former Democratic counsel for the House of Representatives. And I'm Mike Lane, a uh, frequent guest on many programs here on Channel 10. Uh, Republican and uh, proud of it, but uh, here for a different purpose tonight. Mike and I don't agree on much, but there is one thing we do agree on. And what we agree on is that Jim Southworth is one of the best producers and contributing members here at FPA 
uh, that we've really ever seen. Uh, extraordinary talent. Jim Southor has been my producer for three years now, and not only is he terrific in helping getting guests and behind the scenes, he's great technically, and technical things fall apart, but he, he seems to, despite the craziness for a live television show with telephone calls, Jim Southworth gets it all done, and Leo is also terrific behind the scenes helping out. The level of professionalism that Jim and Leo bring to this show, uh, and to FPA in general, is impressive. Uh, I've been uh, a guest at many uh, public access studios, including uh, Alexandria and Arlington, and I can tell you uh, that my experiences with Jim and Leo here at FPA puts this station miles above any of the other stations in the area. Uh, I've also been a contributor on a number of local stations across the country. In fact, I was just on Fox 31 in Denver. Let me tell you something. They don't hold a candle to Jim and Leo. I've been uh, a guest on and off, really, on uh, FPA Channel 10 for a little bit over 10 years. Uh, I started off doing some uh, programs back in uh, early 1998 uh, on a uh, Young Republican television show and then have morphed into some other shows. You know me as a frequent guest on uh, Mark's show, but I also do The Road 2 on uh, Saturday mornings once a month. Uh, I can tell you, uh, with all that experience to see the growth and in, in the professionalism and the activity here at Channel 10 that I can personally attribute to Jim Southworth's leadership uh, is nothing short of amazing. We've done everything from video on the back screen to having callers from Australia to having people call in and challenge a number of guests. Really technically, live television, it's the hardest thing in the world. I was watching CNN uh, just over the convention time. They were having more technical problems than we were. Jim and Leo, if, if Channel 10 loses them, it just it wouldn't be the same. Mark, you know, you make an excellent point there. I also have done a lot of professional television work uh, as a talking head, uh, and I find the level of professionalism, uh, consistency, and uh, just overall effectiveness here at FPA Channel 10 uh, in the shows I do with Jim Southworth to be as professional as the stuff that I've done at professional uh, commercial networks. It really is amazing. So I say vote Obama, Mike says vote McCain, but we both agree to vote Jim and Leo. Jim and Leo, our team for professional. This is Shannon Sullivan, your host for the Inside Scoop Virginia, and I have with me two lovely ladies, uh, lips, lipstick wearing and outspoken, <laughs> and we're going to talk about the issues in the presidential campaign this year. I have Yulil Tate, who's a uh, retired lobbyist for the United Auto Workers, and Rachel Rifkind, who is the chair of the Virginia Democratic Women's Caucus. And um, before we uh, left for break, we were uh, hitting on a, a variety of topics. You know, I don't think we can uh, quite hit all the topics that are that important to uh, women and the family in this, uh, this one little segment. But uh, I think what needs to be stressed, and it, it's kind of skirting around the outside of public dialogue, but um, the Supreme Court. You know, there is uh, perhaps up to three uh, positions that could be uh, nominated in this upcoming presidency. And uh, there's a vast difference between the two candidates Absolutely. and what type of justice they will be nominating. And we're not just talking about, you know, uh, you know a judge. You know, this is someone that will be ruling for the next 30, 40 years. Well, that will be, you know, crafting public policy, you know, from a judicial sense, for 40 years. So when we say this is the most important election of our lifetime, um, okay, not just my lifetime, I'm talking my children, you know, your children, your grandchildren, you know, will be impacted by, I would almost say, a radical um, potential nominee. And their litmus test is choice. It is. Um, it, it, you know what, and what bothers me about the discussion on choice is there's no middle ground. It is or it isn't, and I think that we're missing a lot of the the productive you know discussion that could be going on, and you know what they they've put it up with Sarah Palin. I think she's rallying the evangelicals around her. I mean, she is. She's even uh, to an extreme to, to McCain. Mm -hmm. So on, on, that, on that issue, <laughs> what exactly is her position? Well, McCain, well, McCain has said that he is uh, pro-life, except if, the, yeah, if right. the life of the mother is at risk. And he also uh, says that he wants to see it in the states. Yeah, wants it back in the <laughs> states. Yeah, wants it so back in the states, states, the whole uh -huh. states' rights now. Yes, oh yes, goodness! Yes, yes. <laughs> how how convenient! And I and I think Sarah Palin is is not at all. Yeah, I believe I, that there's there's a there was a, even an abstinence issue with her, and I'm not certain where she is on 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 
teaching absence. I, I, I think that that was, do, are you, do you know what? I have no, no, I don't. I mean, I know her position as far as, you know, abortion is concerned. Um, I mean, she says, what is it? I am as pro-life as any candidate can be. And she does that mean to be in the, the case of rape or of incest. And again, we're back to, you know, where should the discussion actually be? Where is the middle ground? You know, there's, there's extremes out there that shouldn't be a part of it's the so com It's so comforting to see how, how exact some people can, they're, oh, they're absolutely. with no gray, no gray. No, none no. at all. <laughs> and you, I mean, you know, Shannon, I, you know, I think also that, you know, not only does, is the Supreme Court, you know, important just for the whole pro-choice issue, mm -hmm. It has serious implications for other issues as well, mm -hmm. uh, particularly, you know, workers', workers issues, rights. workers' rights issues. Yep. You talk about civil rights issues, the whole notion of affirmative action and the impact that it will have. You know, uh, you know, there's been all this major discussion so. about, you know, eliminating affirmative action oh, yeah. and will you need yes. affirmative action, you know, you know, in the years to come with Mr. Ward Conley yeah. and this whole kind of thing. And just those kind of, you know, the impact of the Supreme Court has such a tremendous impact on this country, uh, particularly when, like I said, those issues of affirmative action, worker right issues, mm -hmm. and just playing right out social justice issues, issues that impact people in this country. Uh, not only just choice, but. Oh, I know. It's, uh, it's a scary thought because we think we're making advancements as far as uh, humankind. Well, I know I don't want to see another Alito, and I do not want to see another Roberts on the Supreme Court. <laughs> or, or Thomas. Uh, or, oh, and, and, and please don't didn't even, even talk about don't that. Don't even mention Clarence <laughs> Thomas. You know. I uh, believe we have a, another phone caller. We have Carla from Fairfax. Um, are you there, Carla? Yes. Yes, uh, my question concerns women and domestic violence. Uh, recently, I was reading an online article on ABC News, and it was stating that assaults against children and women is epidemic in the state of Alaska, mm -hmm. and that Sarah Palin had not um, budgeted for any type of prevention in that state. She finally did, under pressure, um, dedicate a percentage for the victims themselves. And I was wondering if anybody on the panel um, is able to speak about the differences in approach to violence against women and children at the uh, vice presidential candidate level. Uh, well, Carla, I don't know if, uh, if any of our guests had heard about that statistic in I Alaska. Had heard about that. I had not. That's uh, the first time I'm hearing about it, and I'm glad that you brought it to our attention. That's um, very unfortunate because this shouldn't be a debate. I think that when we talk about where we're going to spend our money, you know, that someone's, you know, going to the emergency room, and it's 70% of women, actually, that end up in the emergency room is because of some type of abuse, you know, and it's in the That's home. That's an awful statistic. Why, why are we, you know, again, pinching that penny over, you know, it, it's such a criminal, it, it's beyond, you know, a criminal act. You are taking, you know, advantage of someone that is in your home, you know, it could be physically, um, it could be economically, you know, especially if a woman has children. Um, it's just, it's so degrading to think that, you know, you're, you're not going to provide Women are worth funding. so little. Um, yeah. And yeah. It, it, Carla brings up that, you know, a difference between our vice presidential uh, nominees. Obviously, she talks about, you know, Palin's position, which <laughs> I didn't know. Um, but Joe Biden, I don't know how many people know, actually wrote and championed the uh, Violence Against Women yeah, Act, yes, did. Uh, yes, did. which I, it was groundbreaking. There wasn't any discussion of, you know, it was a secret issue. You know, what happened in your bedroom stayed in your bedroom. Um, well, house. Um, <laughs> the bedroom issue, that's for another discussion. Um, but he says it's actually one of his most proud achievements. I've heard, yeah, I've heard him talk on this. Um, and I, He's actually kind of humble about yes, it, isn't he? Yes, yes, he is. Uh, he, I know he reached out to a lot of women. He uh, he made sure that it was well written as far as you know, making sure it hit where it needed to uh, hit in order to be effective. And the key point was that he made sure that it was ample funding to make yeah. sure that the whole domestic violence network was established and, and set Absolutely. up. They, you know, I don't know if people realize it, but there is a domestic line, mm -hmm. a violence against yep. women's domestic line that they can call. Right. Which uh, was and, and, because and of this piece of legislation. Because of that piece of legislation. There's, yes. it, it's, it's so much of, of what the Obama-Biden ticket brings to this campaign. It's, Everything that, they, that they're addressing, it's the right thing to do. It's not because it's not. It's not because they're going to benefit anyway from it. It's mm -hmm. just it's the right thing to do for a nation that yeah. that we are so proud to be part of. Um, it's it's you know it's just. 
amazing that we have to move this direction, that we, we have so many other things that we have to face, but, but we, we need to address these issues mm -hmm. because it is the right thing to do. Or that these uh, are just kind of, they, they fall to the bottom of the stack, you know, they're yeah. not as, um, I don't know, uh, Hollywood provoking. type, yeah. Oh yeah, but yes. the war and the terrorism, yes. the, all those fear tactics that they'd like to bring down to us. Um, but you know, something about a hotline, a simple phone number for Absolutely. women. You know, 1.5 million women have called that line. And you know, you talk about training, you know, be able to provide awareness. That's for your police officers. That's for Absolutely. the judges, the court system to be understand this intimate issue from a very judicial and, you know, you know, public safety point of view. Well, it just goes to show uh, what type of uh, legislator or I should say uh, vice president mm -hmm. Joe Biden will be uh, when he's elected yeah. vice president. Uh, he has compassion and he also is, is, is a wise legislator. Uh, so. Yeah, the uh, piece of legislation also goes to fund shelters. Live, it's the so those uh, women that don't have anywhere else to go have a safe place for them and their children. And uh, believe it or not, and I think we need to say this as, loud, as loudly as we can, uh, McCain voted against it. Yep. He voted against enacting the Violence Against Women Act. He has uh, attempted to uh, shorten the funding, and uh, this will be an ongoing debate. That's his legacy. <laughs> that, you know, and I, I want to say it as many times but as he's a maverick. He said. Oh, yes, but yes. He's a maverick. Don't forget that. <laughs> okay, so women, you know, paid a little bit less, not sure what's going on as far as uh, your safety in your own home. Uh, McCain's got your back. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be back right after this uh, public service announcement. Hi, my name is Shannon Sullivan. I'm a proud member of FPA and I got involved maybe a year or so ago just coming by the studio at the behest of Jim Southworth and really kind of got a grassroots feel of you know how to operate some of the machinery and was encouraged to you know be a part of the crew and I really was inspired by you know his leadership and building people you know into their certain capacities you know building on their strengths and I felt a part of you know this crew that I had no previous experience with and actually felt a part of the team I think he has immense leadership abilities um, he's you know building this you know political you know show which has expanded its credentials gotten you know nationwide even I'm hearing worldwide success and viewership and I think that there's a lot to be commended there um, I appreciate, you know, all the abilities that he's able to present, you know, expanding the technology, you know, being able to shoot in, you know, various different, uh, you know, uh, off-scene capacities, you know, building uh, the virtual studio, Studio C. I think that his vision to upgrade the technology and make sure that we're state-of-the-art has been um, top-notch. And uh, other than that, I think that anyone wanting to get involved is uh, welcomed, and I think that that's the type of leadership that FPA needs to look forward, in, forward to in the future. So that's my little uh, proud member endorsement for uh, Jim's. Hi, I'm Ron England. I'm the floor director for Inside Scoop. I've been doing it for a couple of years, working with Jim and, and the rest of the crew. Um, I was a first member uh, of the uh, TV station here 94 time frame, 95, um, dropped out for quite a while and came back, recently rejoined as a member. Um, I know that uh, Jim Southworth and Leo uh, both have immense amount of uh, experience and leadership for this station and improvement of the capabilities being provided, uh, creatively uh, uh, managing the contracts and financials uh, flows that are necessary to support the modernization of the equipment here and the programming that, that is provided uh, through the public access. And I think uh, both of them provide the leadership that's necessary, that's, that has to be up front without shenanigans going on in the background that I have heard of other members that are running for board. And I think we need our support behind Jim and Leo and make certain that honesty and good management prevails in the future. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm your host, Shannon Sullivan, and I have with me Eula Tate, who is a uh, retired lobbyist for the United Auto Workers, and Rachel Rifkind, who is the chair of the Virginia Democratic Women's Caucus. Um, 
we, we've been talking a lot about you know, the struggle that women face as far as the economy nowadays, uh, trying to provide for, it could be an elderly parent, it could be a child, it, it could be carrying the weight of a spouse as well. You know, just the, the whole bundle that goes into uh, living and breathing and putting a roof over our heads. Um, I think that we've uh, glossed over some of the, uh, the work and family balance that it requires to do all of that. <laughs> and um, I think a, a main com uh, component of that is the Family Medical Leave Act. And uh, again, a very di big difference between the two camps as far as the McCain and Obama and the legacy of the Bush administration and how they've approached this uh, very fundamentally important uh, piece of legislation. Which came from the Clinton administration, it did by come the way. from the Clinton administration. <laughs> I'm looking as to you, Eula. As a fact, I was there. Because, yeah, uh, we were having this conversation the first, off the camera. The very first piece of legislation that Bill Clinton signed was the Family Medical Leave Bill, and I was Praise God, I was there. You know, we talk um, about priorities. Yes. First bill. First bill. Okay, there's Family Democrats for you guys. Bill, right? <laughs> you know, and I think the first bill because it's the right thing to do. Exactly. exactly. You know, the Family Medical Leave uh, Medical Leave Bill is probably one of the major pieces of legislation that was ever passed in this country, mm -hmm. and particularly when you look at you know a person that you know don't have to you know make a decision if they're going to lose their job or not, mm -hmm. or if they're going to be able to take care of a loved one or a child, or yeah. actually just having a child yourself. Um, or just having the flexibility, the flexibility to be able to, to do, do so. It. it was just a yeah. marvelous piece of legislation. It needs to be extended a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I particularly think, you know, uh, and, and would advocately support uh, having, uh, you know, paid medical leave. We're the only country, you know, industrialized, modernized mm -hmm. country, in, you know, in, in, in the world that doesn't have that. Sweden yep. has it. Germany has it. Uh, a lot of other countries have paid medical leave uh, mm -hmm. up to six weeks, as a matter of fact. Um, and to have, you know, family medical leave where, you know, you don't have to worry about losing your job, you maintain your employment, you maintain everything, it just it makes it a whole lot easier. It makes our whole society a whole lot better. And, and an aside on this, although not directly related to mm -hmm. family medical leave, is that um, McCain John McCain wants to tax your premiums, your benefits oh from your, your, your health insurance. Health insurance. I just thought about that, and that that's a I fine. I thought about it earlier, do. and I forget. Yeah, it went past yeah. Me. yeah, yeah. He wants to tax our, mm -hmm. our fundamentally, health you know, pull apart the employer-based system. You know, oh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, employers. It costs you a little bit to provide those benefits. So, you know, we're going to tax, you know, the benefits, and uh, you know, see how well that'll hold up. Yeah. So it, it doesn't it doesn't uh, bode well for for the, the the working families. No, it doesn't. You know, there's a sad legacy for for the Bush administration and what they have yeah. tried to do with the family and medical leave bill as well. As well. Um, there has yeah. been a battle going on Capitol Hill basically about them trying to change the regulations as it relates to what qualifies you, you know, to take a family, you know, take a family and medical leave. And they have, you know, tried to tweak to the, minimize. Yeah, to They're minimize. They're awfully splitting you know. that unpaid day. Yeah, I mean, and, that, that and you <laughs> have to take your vacation time and, you know, they, they, they're trying to do everything they can to, to undermine this piece of legislation. <laughs> Goodness. So, uh, I do know under the Obama plan, I don't know how he's atta attacking, you know, extending family medical leave. Um, but he has talked about sick leave, you know, yes. and having paid sick leave, I believe, up to seven days, you know, with a year. I mean, it's not a, anything that will uh, you can retire off of or, you know, <laughs> have a nice little vacation, but seven days, just in case you need that flexibility to be able to take your kid to a doctor's appointment. You know, they break their arm. Who knows what happens? It's an elderly parent. To have that flexibility so you can actually balance your life. It removes a little bit of the stress. It does. And uh, an added layer of stress. Uh -huh. And I think I mentioned earlier, you know, it promotes productivity in the workplace. Knowing that you have that, you don't need to worry about, well, if I can skip out a little bit or cut my lunch hour a little bit, maybe I can get this accomplished. You know, you have it. You know, and I think at a bare minimum, it, uh, it provides some stability for people. Yes, um, absolutely. And that's what we need in this country now is more stability, oh, particularly goodness. what's going on you know, economically in this mm -hmm. country and the impact that, you know, it has on, on all working people in this country. It's, yeah. it's a sad commentary. Uh, you stop and think about, you know, I would have loved to have had my mortgage paid for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this, this last week has been just one of the most <sighs> Unbelievable weeks. I can. I just can't believe. You know what's going on. I don't on. think many people necessarily know what the consequences are. I don't yes. think anybody. I don't think even they know what. I, I mean, I have been hearing discussions that this plan that's afoot may mm -hmm. not work. 
Oh, absolutely. I've heard that too. I wonder. Um, I mean, what kind one of point, one point two trillion dollars that we're going to be my great great grandchildren will be paying this bill, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact I've actually heard several times that it's okay, we can just print more money, or China can buy up our debt. Great security. I hope they never call in the debt that we owe. Oh them yeah. yeah. <laughs> but our economy is on a sound footing. That's, the fundamentals yes. are oh, sound. The fundamentals are sound. I do believe that quote is attributed to uh, Mr. McCain. He's going to rue the day he said that. <laughs> and, and I believe his economic advisor as well called us a nation of whiners. Mm -hmm. And that we are in a mental recession. Mm -hmm. Well, Phil Graham, he he mm. failed he failed uh, economics. <laughs> when he was in well, obviously. <laughs> so so putting that with a with a presidential candidate that himself it. confessed doesn't understand economics. I mean, so the most important, and I'll just say the most important <coughs> issue. When we're talking issues of this campaign, the economy and the effect it has Absolutely. on the wider society, is of bare significance to the McCain camp because he self-professes to not understand it. I believe he's reading a couple books. You know, I guess they're the cliff notes to uh, the free market <laughs> economy published by the Republican Party. Um, but, you know, those cliff notes um, didn't quite help him as far as regulation. <laughs> I think he voted some 19 out of 20 times not to regulate, you know, the economy in any way. And I, I just don't, the banking I, well, he's, industry, he's backtracked a little bit on that, but I, I wonder why. I guess it, uh, the certain times call for a uh, but I thought he humbling said, I thought, of opinion. I he said he, you know, was you know, Mr. Regulator. Isn't that, isn't that what? I believe within the last uh, 48 hours that yeah. became his new mantra. Oh, okay. I'm glad you clarified that. <laughs> Maverick personalities, though. You know, when the times change, so do the opinions. Uh, I guess he was against it, you oh, know, he before. Will do, he will do and say anything to get elected. That is, that's the well, case right now. Well, hopefully the American people won't, uh -huh. you know, won't I, fall for I it. Have heard, I heard somebody say to me the other night that the John McCain who ran in 2004 was somebody that she, and she's a Democrat, and mm -hmm. she's, she's a, a, a stalwart Democrat, and she said, I could have lived with a John McCain as president four years ago. Really? But not this John McCain. Well, I'm no. a yellow dog Democrat. He, he's, he's reinvented himself <laughs> this for this. This is the Karl Rove tactics at its, you know, evil oh, genius. The evil genius. At its best. But there's a, uh, you know, there's a sadness in the way yes. it's being conducted. Um, again, we've said, you know, because the issues aren't being addressed, you know, there's not the sincerity talking about women and the family, you know, economy, you know, to the seriousness it needs to be addressed. And, you know, Rachel, you mentioned the tone, the tone oh, of this campaign. Tone. And our last Bother. This is one of the things that bothers me so much is that we've got so much at stake. that deserve a full and open discussion, mm -hmm. but we can't. And they, we've got two different points of view. Get through the trees to, see, to, see, to see the light, to, to, to do this discussion because we've got so much negative. Oh, absolutely. From, and and, and I, I, I think Obama is trying to stay above the fray, but I wonder when he's going to say enough is enough and he's going to, and like, like, like uh, Biden did uh, last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did get a little And I loved it, I loved it, but... Um, I look forward to the debate, that's what I look forward uh, to. Yes, I do yes. believe there's the first presidential debate this Friday. Look for a party in your neighborhood. There are <laughs> debate watch parties. Thank you for joining us on the Virginia Inside Scoop, and we'll be 